A warm welcome to you, um, to our service this morning. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, uh, we're going to begin by praying on this. It's a, a national day of prayer for the present COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we're going to start by praying and asking the Lord's help upon us this day. So let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we want to thank you that we can come to a God who um, is listening to our prayers, a, a God who loves us, a God who is working uh, his purposes out in this world. We come and we praise you for that. Lord, as we spend time together this morning, um, as we sing, as we read from your word, as we hear, hear your word preach, we ask, Lord, that you would minister into our lives in such a way as that we would um, be changed and transformed, that we would know something of you uh, at work in our midst. We pray uh, that you would work, Lord, not just in us as we gather together this morning in, in this way to, to sing and to praise you and to hear from you. But we pray also, Lord, for our nation. We recognize that we are in desperate need of you in these days. Um, we pray about this whole pandemic, Lord. We uh, ask that you would uh, bring about the uh, healing of those who are sick at this moment in time. We pray, Lord, that you would bring about a cure um, for this um, awful virus. We pray for your hand to be upon us uh, as a nation in these ways. Lord, and not just us as a nation, but we pray for all who are suffering um, in these days around our world. We think of those who are working um, on the front line. We think of those who are in hospitals, who uh, are seeking to be um, there for those who are sick and needy. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would draw alongside them, that you'd give them strength. We pray particularly that you'd provide their needs. Lord, we recognize that there have been issues um, in our supermarkets. There have been um, stockpiling, Lord, which has not helped anyone. So we pray against all of these kind of things. We commit this to you. We pray for your uh, gracious uh, and glorious hand um, in, the, in the midst of the detail, Lord, that you'd work these things out for us. We thank you that we can have confidence in you. We thank you that, uh, um, Lord, though this is uh, uh, something difficult that we face, we recognize, Lord, that we're not alone. We have you. We can um, deal with this because you are with us. So we look to you for strength and help in these days. We pray for all those, Lord, who will be um, meeting together today in, in, across, across the world, Lord, seeking your face, seeking your help. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that you'd be pleased to grant us. Lord, we confess our sins. We confess that we have not been what we should be. We, we have not uh, uh, followed you in the ways that we should. We have not um, loved you uh, with the love that we should uh, and Lord, we recognize that we have fallen a long way short, but we thank you again for your grace. We thank you that we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and confess our sin and know that our sins are forgiven and know that we are righteous in your sight, not because of anything that we have done, but because of all, the, of the, all that the Lord Jesus has done on our behalf. So we come this morning seeking you. We come hungry to hear from you. We come um, pleading that you would work in our nation, in the UK and around the world, that you in your grace would do these things for the glory and praise of your name, we ask. We pray, Lord, as well, that you would help our, our youngsters, Lord, in the midst of all of this. Very confusing for them. So we pray that you'd give them your grace as well. Be with each one of us. We pray for those who are at home, self-isolating. Be with them, Lord. It's tough being uh, stuck on your own all, all the day long. And so we just pray that these little... Um, times of, of gathering together in this way would be a blessing to all and that you would work powerfully. Lord, heal our nation, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to hear read to us the passage this morning by uh, Catherine. She's going to read from Genesis chapter 37. So get your Bibles. The reading is from Genesis chapter 37. Joseph's dreams. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. 
he said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered round mine and bound down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he set him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go down to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh. They were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there, where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognised it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Joseph tore his clothes put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him.
but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guards. So life can be discouraging at times, um, and we should preach to ourselves. We should preach to ourselves just like the, uh, the psalmist did in Psalm 42 and 43. Uh, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. And we're going to do that very thing. We're going to praise our God as we sing together. We're going to sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And again, it's the, the Fiddler family singers who are going to be helping us to sing this. So enjoy the song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When weary in this earthly race, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every wild and stormy gale, my uncles and will not fail. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His power is covenant and blood, our mighty defense against the flood. When earthly hopes are swept away, He will uphold me on that day. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When the last trumpet's voice shall sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. So amongst other things, it's Mother's Day today. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, pray and give thanks for, for mothers everywhere. Um, and um, normally we'd give out flowers um, uh, as part of the church service, but obviously I can't really do that. So I'm going to put um, some flower pictures up on the screen, especially for you mums out there. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that uh, as we come uh, to you today we can re remember those that have looked after us our mums those who've uh, spent time caring for us and nurturing us lord we praise you for them everyone we thank you for all um, those who have taken on that role that responsibility of looking after uh, their children and um, really just being a blessing to them we thank you lord for uh, your grace to each one of us in in uh, giving us those that care for us in these ways. We thank you for those that are our mums. We thank you for those that have acted towards us in loving ways like a mother. And we praise you, Lord, that we can um, turn to you and to trust you, uh, Lord, even to watch over our mothers in these days. We pray particularly that you draw near to those um, of us that um, have uh, parents, Lord, who are self-isolating at the moment. We pray, Lord, that you would just watch over them and watch over us in this time. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. So before we come to the sermon, let's pray. Loving Father, as we uh, look at your word this morning, we ask that we might understand what it teaches us, teaches us um, about the situation that Joseph faces, um, but Lord, also uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray that you'd speak into our lives, help us to know how we should live for you in these days. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So um, we're starting a new series in, in Joseph. I figured there was no point carrying on some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, we're kind of in a bit of a new season. So we're looking at the life of Joseph from Genesis. Um, and we're starting in Genesis 37. If you write notes, then um, we're looking at the favoured son.
from that chapter. Now, we often talk about God being at work behind the scenes. Um, the question is, what do we really mean by that? What do we mean when we say that God is at work behind the scenes? Do we simply say that because we're struggling with a situation and um, we can't actually see God's hand at work in it? Um, so we assume that he's there in the background, but don't really know where he's at work. Or is it more that we know that God is behind all things? After all, he um, made this world and there's nothing that happens without his say-so. Um, so really, we're just biding our time to see where God is uh, at work. And um, we can kind of flip between the two. Which one is, is it today? There is that sense that we, in truth, only in hindsight can see uh, God's clear hand at work in, in the events that we live through. So um, we kind of move between the two really don't we now if you read genesis 37 and you look through purely human eyes if you just simply read the account that uh, is there um, then actually it truly is a sad picture isn't it it's a, a picture of of uh, a brother who's bullied um, who is uh, treated badly ends up um, being t torn away from his father put into a foreign land um, and in a, a dreadful situation by the end of it but if you look to see what God is up to, then it truly becomes a, a beautiful picture on, on multiple different levels. And I, I trust and pray that as we go through this this morning, um, that you will discover that God is at, at work behind the scenes in the midst of this. Now, we've been given a glimpse into um, the family life of Jacob, and most particularly in relation to Joseph. And the reason that this happens, well, verse 37 and verses 1 and 2 help us to understand that uh, all um, from this point on in Genesis is about Jacob and how God is at, he's working his purposes out for the good of Jacob and indeed for the good of us all because through Jacob comes uh, Jesus Christ the Messiah. So um, it's for our good. And, and Joseph, while well, he's the son of Jacob, he's the 11th son, um, but though he is nowhere in the, as it were, in the family ranking, he is everything to his father Jacob. He is the, the favoured son. He is the one who is looked upon um, with delight by um, Jacob in the midst of all of these situations. It's Jacob's love for his son Joseph which is uh, at the forefront of this story. Uh, we discover that Joseph right from the outset is different yet the same that comes in uh, verses 1 to 11. Joseph is one of the brothers, yet he is radically different from the others. As I said, he is his father's favourite son. Um, we know that, and we see that in the text, because he's given that richly or, or ornamented um, robe. He's uh, treated differently from the others in the family. Now, um, most likely that's because of him being born to, um, to Rachel, um, he was Jacob's loved wife, so there's obviously uh, some uh, understanding of what's going on there. But the reality is he's, he's, he's a favourite son. He's, he's delighted in. The father loves him, lavishes his love upon him. Um, and uh, uh, we see that, that Joseph isn't actually like his brothers because he's affronted um, by his brother's behaviour. He sees what his brothers are up to. He sees that they aren't living um, to bring honour to their father. He sees that they aren't living in a way which um, uh, brings them honour in the, in the sight of the people around. And so he's affronted by his brother's behaviour and, and conduct. And he won't stand by and allow that behaviour to go unchallenged. You know, it's easy, isn't it? So uh, when we see that things are going wrong around us, it's very easy for us not to actually um, stand up for what is right. We can just go along with it. Well, Joseph is unwilling to do that. He's uh, he sees what his brothers are up to and he, he wants uh, that to change. Well, we also discover in the text that he's in co closer communion with God um, than his brothers. Uh, we see that in the way that he receives these dreams, these dreams which are from God. Um, he uh, obviously is delighted by the dreams and wants to share them with his brothers. He wants to tell them uh, about what God is going to do. And, and so that really just delights him. Um, and so he shares that with his brothers. Well, it doesn't really go down very well, in, in honest, um, to be honest. But he's in this communion with God. He's obviously hearing from him and hearing about his future, though he doesn't fully understand it all 
uh, in those days. His dad, when he hears about the stories, uh, he's wise enough to know that uh, there's obviously something going on here and, and it's not just um, the, the exuberance of youth, as it were, wanting to be in the best position. He's, he, he, he listens to what um, Joseph says. He, he questions it, but he listens and stores it away. Now, he's, uh, he, his very difference means his brothers both hate him and are jealous of him. He finds himself in that precarious position of being disliked by all of his family, as it were, all of his siblings anyway. Um, and in these ways, you know, Joseph hints to us, doesn't he, of another favoured son, uh, one who is the same but different. Now, Joseph is a type of Christ. His life points us to the one who would come and dwell in the midst of humanity, who would be just like us, yet radically different from us, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Jesus Christ, both God and man. And in his humanity, humanity, he was just like us, except that he was without sin. Uh, Hebrews 2 and verses 14 and 15 help us to understand that since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. God is at work and he's at work behind the scenes in Jacob's family to raise up a saviour, one who will rescue the family uh, and rescue them actually from a problem that they, uh, they do not even see or, or f yet fully uh, comprehend. They have no idea that there is a famine coming. They've got no idea that their lives are on the line. They've got no idea that their actions um, are bringing uh, about um, God's judgment in that way. Uh, they are just completely uh, oblivious to it, um, and so they carry on in their sin. Now, we fall into that same ignorance in our day, don't we? We, uh, wand we wander around as though sin wasn't a great problem, uh, yet that is exactly why we need Jesus. That's exactly why we need a saviour, one who can come and rescue us from the enemy that we cannot see. Uh, Yet we for sure feel its consequences, don't we? We feel the consequences of sin in our lives. All too often we, are, um, we feel the, the, the pain of our sin. We feel the struggle of our life. Um, and yet we are often caught up with our own self-pity, like these brothers who uh, were bothered more about their situation than they were bothered about what God would want in their lives. Um, and we don't even recognise God when he's at work in the midst of our lives. We don't see his hand. But we don't comprehend it. We've got no thought of it. Um, now, uh, we need to be those that, uh, that recognise God. And John Flavel puts it like this, our tears so blind our eyes that we cannot see our mercies, the mercies of God in our lives, um, because we're so caught up with what we feel uh, we've been slighted by. Um, and the brothers are like that in this situation. They can't see that God is at work. All they can see is that they, are fe they feel that they're being... Uh, badly treated um, by uh, their father. They feel like they're treated uh, badly and that uh, Joseph is the problem. But before we get carried away, Joseph is not Jesus. He simply points us to him. Um, there is no other good enough willing to pay the price of sin, for he was the only one who could reach out and unlock the gates of heaven to let us in. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who is able to rescue us uh, from our sin today and uh, Joseph though he points to him isn't uh, Jesus he isn't him and so we need to bear that in mind even as we look through the text um, Joseph helps us to see what the Lord Jesus would come to do but he isn't uh, Jesus himself we discover that he's like uh, Jesus in another way though we discovered that there is betrayal in verses 12 through to 28 there is a uh, little does Jacob know that uh, he is sending out his precious son Joseph um, a, a, as a, a sheep amongst wolves. Um, as, Joseph, as Jacob sends off Joseph to go and see his brothers, uh, he's heading towards disaster and neither Jacob nor in this instant Joseph know anything about that. They have no comprehension of what's heading um, for Joseph. Well, even before Joseph gets to his brothers, Plans are afoot for his downfall, aren't they? There is a, a, a work going on behind the scenes to get rid of 
uh, of Joseph, the hatred and the jealousy are boiling over into murderous plans. They want to get rid of Joseph. They want him gone. Um, now, do you know what the brothers uh, were bothered about most? Um, the text tells us that it's the communion of God uh, that is bothering them. It's that uh, the dreams that he's had, it's that understanding that God might actually be speaking into his life and he might actually be the ruler over them and this bothers them the most. Um, they don't want to be ruled over by another. They want to live their lives their own way. Um, and we discover that they've been affected by what they've heard. That message has had an impact on them. And actually Joseph's goodness has had an impact on them. It's exposed their wickedness. It's shown up the uh, rottenness of their hearts. Uh, they want to do evil. Now, if it wasn't for Reuben, Joseph most certainly would have been killed. He would have ended his life at that point. It's only the grace of God that stops them murdering their brother, and God uses Reuben in this particular instance. Um, but while Reuben is out of the way, uh, the other brothers conspire, don't they? They, they suddenly see a, a plausible option. Uh, they want to get rid of Joseph, so they, are, they see uh, the Ishmaelites coming towards them, and they want to sell him uh, as a slave. And um, uh, they, uh, they really just, it's the, their greed, it's their envy, it's, it's the whole thing that really gets on top of them, and they want to get rid of uh, Joseph, because as far as they're concerned, Joseph is is the source of their problem. Now, all these things point us once again, don't they, to our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Uh, envy and jealousy, um, ill treatment and being sold for personal gain, they are all ever, uh, there in, in the Lord Jesus' life. Um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they could not deal with Jesus. They could not um, comprehend having him as part of their lives because as far as they saw it, he was getting in their way. He was ruining their progress. Um, he was uh, uh, the one that was causing them the grief. And so they ill treat him and he's sold, um, as it were. He's sold, his, li his life um, is uh, basically a slave's value. Uh, and he goes um, to the cross in that way. 1 Peter helps us to grasp a picture and understanding of that. Um, 1 Peter 2, 22 to 24 he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. God had a plan and he sent forth his son. Uh, he sent forth his son to deal with that issue. And we have a hint of that in the story of uh, Joseph. Now today we can take some solace in the fact that God has his hands in the details of our lives. He is the one who knows us. He is the one who's watching over us. He has everything completely in his uh, power and in his control. And for Joseph, even the suffering that he goes through will turn out for his good and for the good of his family, even though he can't see it, he can't understand it, but, he, but we know that God is working this out for his good. And for Jesus, his suffering was to accomplish the plan of salvation that he was willing to complete. He faced suffering knowing that it would work out for our good, the saving of countless people. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly came and willingly suffered in order that we might be forgiven, in order that we might know God at work in our lives. Well, we face suffering, don't we, of many different kinds in this world in which we live, and this uh, coronavirus is causing suffering. And we can be assured that as we walk with God in the midst of it, as we have to face hardship, we know that God is at work even in the suffering. William Cowper, in his hymn, he used these words, didn't he? You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Who knows 
maybe God will use us and our personal suffering to save another from an eternity without Christ. Maybe what we are called to go through uh, will have uh, an impact on that bigger plan of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Yet it is good, isn't it, even as we think about this, even betrayal in the plans of God can work out for our good. Um, Joseph didn't understand that. He didn't understand that his brothers treating him in that way would actually work out for his good. Um, But it did, and and in God's grace, even such things can be used uh, by God. That doesn't mean to say that God condones such things. It doesn't mean to say that God wants such things. But what it does mean is that God is not, uh, his plans are not uh, thwarted by evil, uh, no matter what form that evil comes in. And that includes COVID-19. Well, we discover um, that he is like Jesus in another way as well. In verses 29 to 36, we discover he's dead, yet alive. Now, we know that Joseph is not dead. Um, We've got the beauty of that as we read the text. But Jacob, the one whom God is working out the future for, well, he has no clue. He has no clue that uh, Joseph is not dead. As far as he's concerned, his son is dead. And his his sons, uh, Joseph's brothers, conspire to come up with a feasible explanation as to Joseph's disappearance. Um, And in the midst of it, blood is spilt. This time it's the blood of an innocent animal. There is death to cover up their sin. Or the effect of the death upon Jacob is profound. His precious son has been ripped from him. And we discover in the text that that Jacob doesn't really want to uh, get over that. He he doesn't want to... um, to be struggling in that way. He uh, doesn't want wants to, to come to peace with that. This has such an impact upon his life. Uh, these brothers' sins have cost him dear. And uh, we know that it's the same for, for our Heavenly Father, isn't it? When the Lord Jesus Christ um, went to the cross, we discover that. Well, that. We sing a song, don't we? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Uh, Our heavenly father had a plan, but it doesn't mean that in Jesus going to the cross that it cost him any less than it cost Jacob. Um, He suffered because... His son uh, died in our place. His son bore the penalty that our sin deserves. Um, And so he grieved uh, over that. But here is the beautiful thing. He was willing to allow his son to go through that, even that we might be saved, that we might be brought into relationship with uh, with our glorious Heavenly Father as a result. Here is the silver lining in the cloud of despair. Though presumed dead, Joseph is now in exactly the place that he needs to be to save his uh, own family from their own deaths, uh, though neither he nor they have any inclination of it. So Joseph, even as we come to the end of this text that we're looking at this morning, we discover that he is in his um, father's uh, hands, as it were. He is um, being looked after um, and he is in the right place at the right time, his heavenly Father's hands. He is right where he needs to be. God is at work behind the scenes. He is working his purposes out. So Joseph so beautifully shows us Jesus, sold for silver, given up for dead, yet even in the place of death, he is in exactly the right place to save his own people from death. Our sin means we deserve death. Second death, as the Bible puts it. But Jesus willingly goes to the place, uh, that place of death, and bears our death in our place. Innocent blood is shed to cover up our sin, to enable us to live. It's, is God at work behind the scenes in this COVID-19 outbreak? Well, Joseph and Jesus Christ tell us that he is. He is at work bringing about the salvation of his people. Uh, what will look like on the surface to be a mess will turn out for the good of all those who love Christ, for all who put their trust in him. The big question is, 
will you trust him in these days? Will you look and see what he is up to in the midst of all of the difficulty? Will you look for those threads of grace in the midst of your life? Um, maybe it's your uh, at home and you have uh, no opportunity to go out and mix with others. Maybe there's an opportunity for you to, uh, to get on social media, to get on and to speak to others about the Lord Jesus Christ, to take that opportunity uh, as you discover that others are in equally a difficult position as you, yet you have the Lord God at work uh, with you in the midst of that difficulty. Or maybe it is that you can take this opportunity to write to your children, to just tell them how much you love them and to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ if they don't know you, don't know him already. Or opportunities to speak to friends and family alike. Um, in, this, in this world in which we live where uh, we face that reality of death which perhaps we haven't done in a while um, there are opportunities to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and to speak plainly about matters of, uh, of life and death and about the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save us so take courage, take uh, courage from the life of uh, Joseph, take courage from the Lord Jesus Christ and um, even as you have opportunity speak to others about the Lord Jesus and, and as you go about helping others perhaps you're not shut in quite in the same way uh, maybe you have opportunity to go amongst uh, those who are locked in and not just to share um, those uh, earthly needs that they need the shopping and all those kind of things but actually to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ even on those opportunities as, uh, as well so uh, make the most of these days. Trust that the Lord Jesus Christ is at work. Trust that God is behind the scenes and live for him in these days to bring glory and praise to his name. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us with that. So, Father, as we've thought about these things, as we thought about the life of um, Joseph and we've thought about how he points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we thank you that we have a saviour. Uh, one willingly, uh, one who willingly came to die in our place, one who willingly came to save us. Uh, and Lord, even as we look at Joseph's story and, and he was bemused by all the circumstances of it and we can be bemused about the situations that we're in, we ask that we might see your hand, that we might understand that you are at work, that we might look for those opportunities um, to see the Lord's blessing in, in the midst of difficulty. Father, we thank you that you're keeping us safe even to this day. And we continue to ask for your grace for the days to come. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, obviously, it's been a bit different for us today. Uh, but we just ask, uh, we, we hope uh, that this has helped you. And um, we'll seek to be doing something similar in the weeks to come. Um, we hope and pray that this doesn't last too long. We, we look to the Lord to change this situation for us. But um, in the meantime... Keep praying, keep trusting the Lord, keep walking uh, with him. Remember that he is entirely your confidence. So thank you for being with us.